So this is one of the topics that sometimes confuses quite a lot of people. I've seen questions being asked to students and they all look puzzled. They all look at each other and they're bewildered like they've never heard of it before. So I decided let me put this lecture together so that we can actually discuss about fetal biophysical profile. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at the fetal biophysical profile. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Grab a piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So, remember when someone is pregnant, the fetal status or the well-being has to be monitored throughout pregnancy. There are different ways in which you can monitor this uh, fetal well-being during pregnancy. One of the ways in which we monitor fetal well-being is through what is known as a fetal biophysical profile. It's simply just going to be this invasive test that's going to help you detect whether there is presence of asphyxia, fetal asphyxia or not. So in essence, it's something that's just going to be helping you detect whether there is utero placenta insufficiency. Because remember that the fetus is in the uterus. They're not really breathing oxygen from air, but they're getting it through the placenta. And this oxygen is needed for aerobic respiration and for the survival of the fetus. So if there's some sort of asphyxia or some sort of hypoxia, it will mean that this fetus is going to start respiring anaerobically. This anaerobic respiration is going to result in accumulation of lactic acid, which can result in metabolic acidosis, and this can result in fetal death. So the biophysical profile is going to be helping you identify any compromised fetus and it's going to help you institute measures quickly enough before metabolic acidosis actually sets in and before fetal death actually sets in. So it's actually one of the tools that we're going to be using to provide antipartum fetal surveillance. So keep in mind that the basic functions of the fetus are largely controlled by the fetal nervous system. So even the parameters that we look at at the fetal biophysical activity is going to be initiated and it's going to be modulated and regulated by the central nervous system. So it means that if there is some sort of hypoxia or decrease in oxygenation, it's going to affect the fetal central nervous system. Hypoxia, like I said, is going to result in less oxygen being delivered to the tissues, especially those of the brain. This is also going to result in global and hypoperfusion of various organs in the fetus. Then this is also going to translate into anaerobic respiration, which results in lactic acid, pH of the blood of the fetus begins to drop, there's going to be some metabolic acidosis that is there. This metabolic acidosis can cause CNS depression, it can lead to changes in the biophysical activity. Now what are some of the indications and the test frequency of a biophysical profile? So we usually do it when you get a non-reactive, non-stress test, I'll explain what that is. We can actually incorporate it as part of the biophysical profile. Then, of course, we also do it for high-risk pregnancies. I will allude to the different risk factors that can be considered as high-risk or risks that are there to certain pregnancies where you'd want to actually do the biophysical profile. So the test frequency is usually weekly after a normal non-stress test and twice weekly after an abnormal test. But of course, the frequency of these tests is going to be individualized for each person. So these are some of the maternal factors as well as fetal factors that can increase the risk of having a poor perinatal outcome. Things like advancing maternal age, obesity, hypertension, cyanotic heart disease, thrombophilias, diabetes, thyroid disorders, chronic renal disease, connective tissue diseases, cholestasis, hemoglobinopathies, isoimmunization, and even a prior history of unexplained stillbirths. In terms of fetal factors, you have things like intrauterine growth restriction, certain structural abnormalies, some genetic syndromes, fetal arrhythmias, blood group incompatibilities, fetal anemia, you can have some congenital infections and even multiple gestations. So what exactly are the components of a biophysical profile? So it predominantly has the five components. We have the measurement of the amniotic fluid volume in some cases they use what is known as the amniotic fluid index. I'll talk about amniotic fluid very shortly. 
we assess the fetal breathing movements, we look at the gross body movements, we look at the fetal tone, and then of course the non-stress test or the fetal heart rate. So each of these parameters is going to be given a maximum score of 2, and you have 5 parameters, meaning that the maximum score that you can get out of a biophysical profile is 10 out of 10. So if you have these ultrasonographic variables that are normal, then the you have a fetal heart rate that is variable, then the fetal heart can actually be uh, excluded because it's not going to change the predictive accuracy of this test. Um, but if you have one or more of these other parameters that are abnormal, then you have to do the non-stress test. Then check if the fetal heart rate is reactive or it's non-reactive. I'll explain what that means a bit later on in this video. So just a little bit about each of the components and I'll explain each of the components. I'll also show you videos of what they look like on the ultrasound so that you can get a better perspective of what this biophysical profile is all about. So remember the amniotic fluid is this fluid that is going to be there in the in, within the uterine cavity where the fetus is swimming in this fluid or staying in this fluid. Now it has many purposes, immune function, development of the lungs, development of the limbs, it helps in protecting against mechanical trauma, it helps in regulation of the temperature of the fetus, it also even helps to some extent in exchange of the waste materials and even gaseous exchange to some extent. So remember that the maintenance of this amniotic fluid volume is quite a dynamic process and there's going to be a balance between the absorption and the production of the amniotic fluid. The key point or the benchmark that I want you to remember is eight weeks. So the events that are happening before eight weeks, the events that are happening after eight weeks. So what is happening before eight weeks? So before eight weeks, most of the amniotic fluid is going to be coming from the amnion, it's also going to be coming from the fetal skin through a process that's known as transudation. This is what's going to be responsible for production of the amniotic fluid. Now how is it going to be absorbed? Before eight weeks again, most of it is going to be absorbed through transudative amniotic fluid absorption passively. It's going to be reabsorbed passively, that's before eight weeks. So the production is through the amnion and the fetal skin and then it's also going to be absorbed passively. Now after eight weeks, the fetus is able to urinate and most of the amniotic fluid is going to be urine. So yes, you do swim in your urine at one particular point. So the fetal urine is going to become the primary source of amniotic fluid production and we actually see that near term you may produce about 800 to 1000 mils of fetal urine each and every single day and the fetal lungs can also produce some fluid about 300 mils per day at term but much of it is going to be swallowed actually before it enters into the amniotic space. Now after eight weeks the swallowing reflex also has developed and most of this fetus is going to be swallowing the amniotic fluid so it's going to be gotten rid of by swallowing this amniotic fluid. So at, after eight weeks of gestation most of the amniotic fluid is going to be swallowed and near term you swallow about 500 to about a thousand mils per day. And the lesser amount of amniotic fluid actually can be absorbed through the fetal membranes. It can also enter into the bloodstream and about 250 mils of amniotic fluid is actually absorbed through this route. A small amount actually can cross the amnion and enter into the maternal bloodstream about 10 mils per day near term. So you find out that you get the maximum volume of amniotic fluid roughly at around 34 weeks, that's about 750 to 800 mils, and then it tends to decrease after that 600 to at 40 weeks and then the amniotic fluid continues to reduce beyond 40 weeks. So there is always now this balance between the absorption and the production of amniotic fluid. So if there is more absorption and less um, production, there may be oligohydramnios. If there is more production and less absorption, there may be polyhydramnios. So remember that the amniotic fluid volume is going to be dependent on the fetal urine output, like I said, the pulmonary fluid production as well as the ability of the fetus to swallow. So a decrease in the amniotic fluid volume is going to be resulting in, is, is going to be as a result of fetal hypoxia, it's going to be as a result of placental insufficiency. So you may actually determine that the volume is considered normal if we get a vertical pocket of amniotic fluid that is greater than two centimeters. I'll show you how exactly we do this when we come to look at the amniotic fluid index. So in terms of our biophysical profile, the first parameter I want to talk about is the amniotic fluid volume. So you give them a score of two, 
which is considered normal, if you have one or more pockets of fluid measuring two centimeters or more in the vertical axis. Then you give them a score of one, which is abnormal, if either you have no pockets or the largest pocket is less than two centimeters in the vertical axis, then you give them a score of one. So that's the easiest parameter, very easy amniotic fluid volume. Now, how exactly do we do this? So before I come to the amniotic fluid index, I want us to talk about the single deepest pool. I also want us to talk about the amniotic fluid index. So with the mother that's going to be lying supine, you're going to actually demarcate the uterus. As I've already shown you on this image on the screen right here, we can see that the uterus then is going to be demarcated here in the center of the umbilicus. So you have a line that's coming through the umbilicus horizontally like that. Then you have another line that's along the linear nigra of the woman. So as such, you now divide the uterus into four quadrants. The first quadrant, second, third, and fourth. So now you're going to measure the perpendicular distance of each quadrant, meaning your probe is going to be measuring in quadrant one, in quadrant two, in quadrant three, in quadrant four. And this distance of amniotic fluid that you're going to be measuring is going to be perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the mother. So perpendicular to the vertical axis of the mother. And the portion where you're measuring should not consist of any fetal parts. It should not consist of any umbilical cord, none of that. So once you have measured the single largest pool or the single deepest pool, you can use that to estimate the amniotic fluid volume, whether it's adequate or not. And from each of those quadrants, if it's greater than two centimeters, then already you can give them a score of two on your biophysical profile. Now, if you add these scores together, what you're going to now get is what is known as the amniotic fluid index. So the largest, the sum of the vertical pockets from the four quadrants of the uterine cavity, we refer to that as an amniotic fluid index. Now, an amniotic fluid index that is less than five is going to be associated with increase in perinatal mortality as well as an increase in perinatal morbidity. So that's how we're going to be checking the, um, measuring the amniotic fluid index and also measuring the single deepest pool. Remember that these parameters are going to be used to make a diagnosis of polyhydramnios as well as make a diagnosis of oligohydramnios. So now, here's a video that I've put. So I, I'm just going to first explain what's going to be in the video. So here you have an individual that's going to be measuring um, the largest pocket of fluid in each of the quadrants of the mother on the abdomen in the vertical dimension. So each of these values is going to be added and the total is what is referred to as the amniotic fluid index. So now I'm going to play the video and then you should be able to see what exactly is happening in the particular video. And keep in mind that in terms of the ultrasound, the Lyqua is going to appear dark. So as you can see, he's trying to find those dark areas which don't have any fetal parts in them. They don't have any umbilical cord in them and you're measuring. I hope you guys are paying close attention to the video. I'm trying to search for another part from another quadrant, as you can see there. He's frozen the image and then he's measuring the vertical dimension. So remember when you, with your ultrasound probe, um, this is going to be the anterior side, this is posterior. From an, So that was like from the second quadrant, I think now they're looking for the third quadrant. Okay, there, it's been frozen. Okay, there is the next, so that. Then of course, once you have measured each of the single deepest pools, then you can add them. And then this is going to be your amniotic fluid index. Okay. So now, before I come to the other parameters that are there, I just want to mention something that is very, very important. So remember that these other parameters are greatly affected by the maturation of the central nervous system. So it means that at certain gestational ages, you're not going to expect those things to be present and they mature when a, a fetus has reached a specific age, meaning before the age of 28 weeks, you're not going to be able to pretty much 
have integrated behavioral patterns. For example, you won't be able to notice before the age of 12, you're not going to be able to, 12 weeks, you're not going to be able to monitor any fetal breathing. You won't be able to see that on the ultrasound. So as you can see here for the gross motor movements, it's six weeks. By six weeks, they should be present. Then breathing movements by 12 to 14 weeks. The fetal heart accelerations resulting from fetal movements, it's about 18 to 20 weeks. The sleep-wake cycles, about 18 to 22 weeks. And of course, integrated behavioral patterns, roughly at around 28 weeks. We come now to the next parameter, which is the fetal breathing. So we give them a score of 2, which is considered normal. If you notice that there's one or more episode lasting more than 20 hours with within 30 minutes of the test, then... We consider it as abnormal if they don't have any breathing movements that you can notice or there's no episode that is lasting more than 20 seconds within 30 minutes. Now, according to the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, they actually maintain the original findings of this that were first described by Manning and his colleagues in the year 1987. So in some textbooks, you may see a slight variation where they're going to tell you that one or more episode of rhythmic fetal breathing for at least 30 seconds instead of 20 seconds, but then this was revised. The findings were revised from the 1990s and were revised it to 20 seconds as opposed to using the threshold of 30 seconds. So it's going to be one or more episodes lasting more than 20 seconds within 30 minutes. So here's a video and in this particular video you're going to have um, a fetus that is going to be showing this rhythmic deflection of the chest which are indicative of fetal uh, breathing. Now you're going to notice that the movement of the chest in the diaphragm is not going to be in synchrony with the heart. I'll show you where the heart is when I'm playing the video. I'll show you where the heart is and I'm sure you'll be able to pick up where the heart is. And initially when this person started off the uh, ultrasound it was in a transverse view but then afterwards they switched to a sagittal view then finding an oblique view. And in this particular instance of this video we can see that the breathing is okay. So even beyond the usual 20 period second that the, we're talking about on the previous slide. So this was a normal fetal breathing. So I'm going to play the video so that you can have a look. So there it starts off as a transverse view. There, if you can notice where the heart is. So this here is the heart. What's beating there is the heart. You can even notice the pattern movements of the chest and how the diaphragm is also moving. You can see that this child is breathing quite all right and it's going to be lasting longer than the 20 second period. If you're not seeing this so well, please increase the quality on your settings so that you can put them at the highest possible quality for you to be able to appreciate these videos very well. Okay, so that's about it on that video. Now, in this particular video, this one here, there are some movements that are going to be mistaken for fetal breathing. So even though there is a bit of some fetal breathing that you can see, the video is, is not going to be showing this fetus breathing continuously for 20 seconds. There is some pulsations that you can see of the iota even the mother, when the mother breathes in and out, the abdomen tends to move as well. Even posteriorly, the fetal iota is also going to be pulsating in the sagittal view. In this particular video, you'll be able to see the cardiac activity, but you can't really see the deflections of the chest as we saw in the previous video. So I'm going to play this video and you should have a look very closely. See the pulsations of the iota. So there's the heart. So these movements don't mistake them for fetal breathing. They are probably something else. We do not want to mistake them for any fetal breathing. 
the heart rate is, is there quite right, but the fetal breathing, we don't really notice it for a sustained period of 20 seconds. Okay, so that's about the video. If you still don't see what I'm seeing, you can replay the video, you can pause the video, rewind, and watch it over again. Okay, so the next parameter is gross body movements. So these ones are going to be scored two for a normal, meaning that you, if you are noticing two or more discrete body or limb movements within this 30 minute period that you're examining this woman, if there are episodes of active continuous movement, we consider it as a single movement. Then for a score of one, which is abnormal, if they have less than two episodes of body or limb movements within 30 minutes, we give them a score of one. So again, the um, American College of Obstetrician and Gynecology still maintain the original findings that were there in 1987. So they say three or more discrete body movements or limb movements within three, uh, 30 minutes. But now I think it's been revised to two or more um, discrete body movements or limb movements within 30 minutes. In terms of the fetal tone, it's give them a score of two. If there's one or more episodes of active extension with return to flexion of the fetal limbs or the trunk, for example, they're opening and closing their hand, we consider that as normal tone. We give them a score of one. If there's slow extension with return to partial flexion or there's movement of the limb in full extension or there's absent movement whatsoever or there's a partially open fetal hand, we give them a score of one. So here's a picture that's going to be showing gross motor movements of the lower and the upper limb and the tone. So in this video, we see that there's movements of the fetal lower extremities, including one episode of flexion and extension. So I'll play the video so that you can have a look at what's happening in this particular video. You can see the limb. Okay, there we go. And this isn't this isn't sped up. It's not a sped up video. It's playing in real time. Okay. Then in this particular video, we're going to have generalized movements of the fetal upper extremities. Then as we'll notice in this particular ultrasound video, the upper extremity is going to come and then it's going to rest on the fetal chest and the chin. Then of course, the ultrasound transducer is moving laterally across the mother's abdomen. So two distinct episodes of flexion and extension are going to be seen in this same particular video. And there are many cross-sectional views of the three vessel umbilical cord and the floating echogenic particles of the vernix that are seen in the amniotic fluid. So have a look at this video and you'll be able to see what exactly has been explained, that I, what I've been telling you about on this particular video. So you can see that that's the limb there. You can see this is like the face of the child. This is the limb here. This is the face. The limb was just there. You can see some particles of the vernix and even the umbilical cord. So then we'll come now to the last bit, which is the non-stress test. So here you give them a score of two if they have two or more episodes of acceleration for more than 15 beats, 15 beats or more per second for longer than 15 seconds, which are going to be associated with the fetal movements within 20 minutes. You give them a score of one, which is abnormal if there's one or more episode of an acceleration of the fetal heart rate or acceleration that is less than 15 seconds within 20 minutes. So remember that in the non-stress test, it's this, just this continuous electronic 
monitoring of the fetal heart along with recording of the fetal movements. So you're going to be doing your cardiotocography, your CTG. I'll do another lecture on CTG. If you really want that lecture to be done, just comment in the section below as in please do a lecture for CTG so that we can get the CTG done. So there is going to be an observation that's going to be associated with the acceleration of the fetal heart as it increases with fetal movements. And then of course this is going to be indicative of a healthy fetus. Remember that these accelerations that are associated with fetal movements are probably thought of as a reflex. And it should be emphasized that even though the test is quite valuable to identify the fetal wellness, it's not going to be quite accurate in identifying illness of the fetus. So what do we mean by a reactive or non-reactive non-stress test? So if you get two or more accelerations of more than 15 beats per minute above the baseline and longer than 15 seconds in duration and they're present for tw during a 20 minute observation, we call that as a reactive, it's a reassuring um, result. Then non-reactive if there's no any cardiac activity. Remember that a reactive non-stress test is going to be associated with uh, perinatal death of about five per thousand live births, but with uh, perinatal death which is about 40 per thousand birth compared to those that have a non-reactive non-stress test. And the test should be started after 30 weeks and the frequency should be done at least twice weekly. So remember that the test has a false negative rate of 0.5% and a positive rate of about 50%. So here's an example of a reactive non-stress test. As you can see on top here, we have these accelerations that we can see here. So if we look at this top box of that, which is going to be indicating, or this top graph here at the top, this is going to be indicating the fetal heart rate. So if you're looking at this, it's going to be a graph that's going to be having the x-axis which is going like this which is indicative of the time and you have the y-axis here which is indicative of the heart rate. So if you're going along the x-axis along the horizontal plane each small box is going to be representing 10 seconds. Then if you're going along the vertical axis here in terms of the beats each um, small box is going to be representing 10 beats per minute along the vertical axis. So the baseline heart rate in this particular tracing is roughly about 140 to 150 beats per minute. And as we can see, we see that there are at least two accelerations of the fetal heart rate within actually even less than 20 minutes. So here's a summary of all the findings in terms of the biophysical profile. And you can pause the video right now, get a screenshot of this, write this down. If you're taking down notes, it's going to help you. So what are some of the things that you're going to be doing when you get a, the, the total score? So if you get a biophysical score of 8 to 10, this is usually normal. There's less risk of fetal hypoxia. So what you can simply do is you repeat test at least weekly um, or even more. If they are more than 36 weeks, you can consider delivering if you have assurance of fetal lung maturity, that is a lecithin sphingomyelin, if, but if the lecithin sphingomyelin ratio is less than two, then you can repeat the test in about four to six hours. So if the lecithin sphingomyelin ratio is greater than two to 2.5, then you can actually be assured that there's some fetal lung maturity. A score of six is going to be suspect of chronic asphyxia. So if they are greater than 36 weeks, you of course deliver them, unless if there's no fetal lung maturity that is um, assured. Then if they have a score of four, then we should suspect chronic asphyxia. And then if a score of zero to two, we should strongly suspect some asphyxia may be there. So if they are more than 36 weeks, you deliver. If they're less than 32 weeks, then repeat the test in four to six hours. We test them for 120 minutes. So persistent scores that are four or less, we deliver them regardless of the gestational age. So there are some factors that tend to affect the biophysical profile. So there are things like fetal sleep, uh, early gestational age, the late gestational age, maternal glucose ingestion, maternal alcohol ingestion, maternal magnesium administration, artificial rupture of membranes, premature rupture of membranes, and even labor. So if you look at this, it's the arrows that are pointing downwards, it means that it does affect the parameter, the arrows that are pointing upwards means that it also affects. So pointing downwards, it decreases this particular parameter. Pointing upwards, it increases a particular parameter. If there's a dash, it means there's no effect. Then of course, if it's left blank, then I'm sure there are some that you can see that are left blank here. It would mean that there is no in, there is not enough data that's provided for us to comment on this particular parameter. Again, you can pause this video, take a screenshot of this. I think it's a self-explanatory table. 
So how exactly do we do this by physical profile? So of course the mother will go to the ultrasound department and we begin with noting the time when we're starting this test. So the profile should be completed when all the variables have been observed, but if a full 30 minutes has elapsed, then you must actually, if the parameters are normal, you can end it before 30 minutes. But if the parameters are abnormal, then you have to go for a full 30 minutes before you can actually say that this uh, is an abnormal um, biophysical profile. So the scan should start with a general survey, noting the position of the fetus as well as the presence of cardiac activity. Then some people, even though it's not part of the biophysical profile, some people look at things like placenta position, the placenta grade, the fetal morphology, the fetal biometry, and they sometimes do this commonly in the procedure when they're doing a biophysical profile. Then we check the amniotic fluid volume and we assess if it's normal, if it's one or more pockets of the fluid are detected that are measuring at least two centimeters in the vertical axis. Remember, if the largest pocket measures less than two centimeters, this may be oligohydramnios. And another thing that is quite important when you're measuring the amniotic fluid volume and even the index, the amount of pressure that is going to be exerted by the transducer, by the probe, on the woman's abdomen is going to be inversely proportional to the depth of the fluid. Meaning that if this ultrasonographer applies a lot of pressure on this woman's abdomen, it may give you false results that may indicate that this woman has some oligohydramnios when they actually don't. And I've seen, and I've seen this many times in clinical practice where a woman comes in, they report oligohydramnios, but when the child is born, there's even a lot of like what that is there, possibly because of the pressure that is applied by the transducer. We then come and we check the uh, fetal movements that are judged, and then also the gross movements are checked for both the lower and upper body as well as the trunk. We also assess the tone. So when do we, how do we actually use this biophysical profile? So remember it's an antepartum test that um, can actually give us a hint of the fetal well-being or other methods that can be used should not be performed earlier than the gestational age that is required at which the, if you were to deliver this baby, would, they would survive outside the uterus or active intervention for a fetal compromised um, infant may be possible. What do I mean? If a child is 22 weeks, you already know that it's not possible for you to do a biophysical profile and get an accurate result for at least someone who's above 28 weeks. So that's what I mean that for those that are below this, don't even waste your time to do your biophysical profile. So there is no indication that exists for testing in a fetus at term when the likelihood of you inducing this patient is high and the likelihood of success of that induction is high when vaginal delivery is contraindicated for obstetric reasons. There's no need for you to do the biophysical profile. But for the patients with a low probability of success for induction, then we can use a biophysical profile as we wait for cervical ripening. So in this patient, the biophysical profile is going to avoid maternal morbidity resulting from a failed induction that may end up in you taking them to caesarean section. The frequency of the test tends to vary, like I said earlier on. So in high-risk patients, we can test them starting weekly, although twice-weekly testing is actually the standard for pregnancies that are beyond 42 weeks and for patients that are insulin-dependent um, diabetes mellitus patients and the frequency of the testing generally increases in direct proportion to the severity of the maternal or fetal conditions that I mentioned earlier on and once you get an abnormal biophysical profile then you should evaluate and intervene depending on the circumstances. So if you get an abnormal score at term then you should prepare to deliver this woman. An abnormal score in a fetus that is very far away from term you're going to conservatively manage this um, woman manage the pregnancy because the risk of death is pretty much similar when the child is going to be delivered and because they'll be premature. So in these patients, then we want to do daily testing. But of course, sometimes we have limited resources in our setup. There are some recommendations by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So number one, the antepartum fetal testing at 32 weeks gestation is appropriate for most high-risk pregnancies. The second thing is that if there is a maternal condition, or well, if the maternal condition is stable and the test results are reassuring, then fetal monitoring through our non-stress test, uh, biophysical profile, or modified biophysical profile, or contraction stress test are typically repeated at weekly intervals. So in the absence of any obstetric contraindication, uh, delivery of the fetus with an abnormal test results 
often may be attempted by induction of labor with continuous central pattern monitoring of the fetus and uterine contraction. So if you don't have facilities of monitoring this woman that has a non-reassuring or a very poor biophysical profile score, you're better off actually delivering them via cesarean section. Then I also want to talk a little bit about the modified biophysical profile. So it just simply combines the non-stress test as a short-term indicator of fetal acid-based status together with the amniotic fluid volume as a long-term indicator of placental function. So the results of the modified biophysical profile are going to be considered normal if the non-stress test is reactive and the amniotic fluid volume is greater than two centimeters in its deepest vertical pocket, and they're going to be considered abnormal if you have either the non-stress test, which is non-reactive, or the amniotic fluid volume in its deepest pool that is two centimeters or less, meaning that there is some oligohydramnios. So either if the non-stress test or the amniotic fluid volume is abnormal, then a complete biophysical profile or a contraction stress test are going to be done in this particular woman. I really hope you enjoy this video on the biophysical profile and I've shed more light on the biophysical profile. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.